thanks, Nicola. Um, I'm extremely stoked to be here and quite <laughs> to us, and quite a bit intimidated as well. But um, so yeah, Nicola already sort of introduced myself. Dashmale, that's my Twitter handle. I'm a freelance uh, real-time graphics developer. Um, if you prefer that uh, one-man studio, uh, that works as well. Uh, my website is on dashmale.com. Uh, that's a Deshmal is a reference to Metropolis, like old movie, great movie. Uh, the type of work I do is usually most often is WebGL, like web-based interactive experiences for product launches and stuff like that. Um, I've worked on product configurators, which I uh, strangely enjoy, which I think most people really don't, but I, I like it. And then I've worked on a couple of interactive installations as well, like um, one using Unity with the guys from No Computer and Matt uh, worked on that as well. Then there was an Open Frameworks project, and the bottom one was a Cinder project. I'm just going to show, oh yeah, this. Uh, I obviously do a lot of experimenting just for fun, trying to like do some stuff. But I'll just show you a little show reel that I built, just showing the WebGL stuff that I do, just to give you an idea of what I work on. I'll get back to this later on in the talk as well, look how this was made. Uh, for this project, it was really important to get all the materials right, so the car paints, like the rim lighting, the semi-metallic look. And for some reason, the client really insisted on their, their, uh, on their mock-ups that the floor was this glossy uh, reflection type uh, surface. So the further from the floor uh, the reflection is, the softer it gets and stuff like that, which is quite fun to do. Uh, for this project, it was really important to get like a photo studio look. Like there's a soft box on, on, on the jewels and then get dynamic, really soft shadows on the floor and get the, the internal reflections of the diamond really realistic and very shiny and sparkly and stuff. Just getting fluffy snow trying to do something. For this project, like the iridescent surface on the shoe, like this kind of weird uh, thing that Adidas was, was releasing, it was really important to get that realistic and get these tiny specks in there as well. Yeah, that's the, just a short overview of like, projects from the last year, a bit longer ago. And then apart from this type of stuff, I also like, like uh, working on 3D engines. That's kind of a weird hobby of mine. And as Nicola already explained, I, I like built, uh, helped building uh, a way 3D back in the day in Flash, which um, I did the first core prototype of a way 3D4, the first version that used the GPU. But since then, I've moved on to WebGL. And I start this is just this personal playground uh, engine called, that I call Helix. And that's what I'm mainly what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So Helix is just a personal playground WebGL game engine. Like it's it's a 3D engine that's built sort of like a game engine. I'll get back to that later. It's open source using the MIT license. You can just grab it from from GitHub. Uh, Deshmale Helix JS. Have to point out, I just write it for me, not for you. If you want to use it, that's fine. But it's really just like something I like to play around with, and people can check it out, um, learn from it port it to 3.js or whatever you want. Um, the code is there. 
Um, and it, it's just like a physically based rendering type engine that um, supports global illumination using spherical harmonics and all that kind of stuff. So um, probably you're thinking like, why on earth would you build your own 3D engine? That's a question I get a lot. Uh, if there's stuff like 3JS around, there's Play Canvas, there's Babylon, uh, there's A-Frame if you want a real game engine, more type, there's, there's Unity, why would you spend uh, time bothering? The short answer is I just, I can't help myself. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hobby and I just start building it and then I got lost and before I know it, I have like a one megabyte code base, like concatenated JavaScript that I just wrote. And the long answer is obviously the first reason is to learn stuff. Uh, there's no way like learning something than doing it yourself from scratch. And like for instance, you, you learn uh, about mathematics in a completely different way than you do when you, you just read theory books because books focus on theory and then you really like, start looking at, at math classes as, as kind of building blocks and all that. And then obviously you learn a lot about graphics and how the GPU works very on the core level because you need to optimize stuff. And finally, you learn a lot about API design as well because you try to build something scalable because uh, most game engines need to be scalable in some way, even if you just build it for yourself. And then you really start experimenting and looking at other engines, like how does Unity build their, uh, their architecture, how does 3GS work, and you look at all those things and you learn a lot from it, and then you, you kind of bundle things together and, and build your own thing, and so on. Like the, the list of stuff you get to learn is, is endless, really, because the 3D engine or a game engine contains so much things. And then, of course, like one of the main reasons I built Helix is for the, 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 the experiment you can do with it. Because if, if you use, for instance, 3GS, which is a, a great engine by itself, but you're always limited by, by the design decision someone else made for you. And building a 3D engine for yourself, you can really build something that suits your exact needs. And that means that you can just experiment freely, adapt your engine because you know it inside out for what you need. And then if you really want to, like you build something in your engine, you want to use it in, in 3GS, then you can always port later. For instance, I'm, I'm, I'm personally running a custom 3GS version, which is basically just the, the, the basic 3GS uh, code base, but I wrap it with my own kind of framework around it to kind of mirror how, how Helix works. And I can often just take code from Helix and use it in 3GS, for, for instance, like for uh, custom shadow mapping, like really soft shadows, um, sometimes particular for, for certain platforms that don't need to run everywhere. And then in the end, you really get a, a certain payoff in the form of experience. Because as I said, you've looked at all the other engines to see how they do things, and you try to build it yourself. So you get to learn all these platforms, and so it's easier to switch between them, to dig into their cores, and really adapt them to your needs as well. Because anything you need to do, you've already built. So you kind of know what to expect in other 3D engines, and you can just dig in there and start hacking. I once, I once was hired to do uh, an Unreal project, and I've never touched Unreal. And that made it uh, very easy to just adapt Unreal's code, because that was like, what I was hired for, just to change certain shaders in Unreal, rather than actually use Unreal to build something. And then obviously, being able to hack into the core and change stuff means that you can do a lot of things that just don't come out of the box. Like using 3GS, you can build new stuff for it and share it and contribute to it. And so uh, the rest of this talk, uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, talk a bit about 3D engine architecture, not like a kind of bird's eye perspective uh, kind of thing, not, not getting into it too deep. Um, I want to share some, some getting started knowledge, and then I'll, I'll sh also show some case studies uh, containing some tips and tricks on shaders and, and scene graph stuff. So um, I'm going to grab a drink for a second. So the first thing uh, I want to show you is kind of what exists in a 3D engine. And there is so many parts in there. And this is just like a course overview. There's obviously your math lib because you're working with uh, linear algebra. Uh, there is abstractions, which are kind of like um, wrappers for low-level WebGL or OpenGL code that, for instance, a texture object, a shader object, a vertex buffer object. They just wrap all the low-level code so it's easier to work with that and a bit more efficient. Then the scene graph is something I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk a bit more about in a second. And I'm going to skip physics because usually what you do with physics is you, you, you use Canon JS or, well, I do, uh, because I, I'm not really interested in building a whole physics engine. That's a whole different ball, ball game. I'm more into uh, rendering. 
And that scripting is obviously just JavaScript in this case. And rendering is definitely something I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to as well. But so there's just all these things. If you want to build it, you can. And you can learn about it and then pick and match whatever you want to do. So first thing you're going to build is probably the math library, because all, everything that you do in 3D is math based So that's definitely going to be one of the first things you'll, you'll build. It's going to be small at first and then extend. And uh, you'll need to, if, you do, if you're not too familiar with math, you're going to need to learn a bit. Um, and there's always going to be some theory that you need to learn. And I recommend this book. It's uh, made by Eric Lengel, written by Eric Lengel. And it really teaches like, everything you need to know to get started with math. But of course, any math book tends to focus on theory, because mathematics love rigor. That's, that's what makes math work. But it, it's usually light and intuition. And if you work on your 3D engine, that's what you'll build. You really start looking at like a cross product between two vectors as something completely different as what a, a textbook teaches you, because then you, you, you just start thinking of it as a way to construct uh, like perpendicular vectors from stuff. And then you can use that to, for instance, build ribbons and stuff like that, or, or look at vectors. And that starts making sense if you do that. So I just, just wanted to mention that, that don't be afraid of the moths. Just embrace it. Swallow some of the theory, and then just learn to love moths, because it's really useful. Even if you're using like existing 3D engines, it's, it's often useful to straight dig into the, the, the matrices rather than using the, the Euler angles and the, and the quaternions. Then a uh, second very important part of a 3D engine is called the scene graph. And you're probably kind of familiar with that if you've used any sort of 3D tool. It's basically the data structure that all your objects, your 3D objects, go into, like your meshes, your, your camera, your lights. Everything is somehow contained in a scene graph. And it just basically defines a positional hierarchy. Um, to give you an idea, uh, you can compare it to the 3D version of the JavaScript DOM. So you have a, uh, a scene, you attach a table to it, you attach a vase to the table, and then that means that if you move the table, the vase will move. If you move the vase, nothing else will happen, just the vase will move. So that, that should be pretty clear, right? That everyone kind of knows this concept. Then related to that is the idea of spatial partitioning. And that's a separate data structure. Sometimes it's part of the, of the scene graph. Sometimes it's separate. I like to keep it separate. And that's just there to optimize scene queries. So if you render a, a scene with many objects in there, you're not going to want to render all the objects. You just care about what's in the view. And spatial partitioning exists to make that process faster. Like, for instance, also, if you click on something, you need to send an array. And spatial partitioning makes that. Uh, much faster. To give you a, an example, by the way, I'm going for the ugliest sides of the conference. Uh, try using um, OpenOffice, and this is what you get. So basically, you have like back to the table vase relationship. Um, what you do is you just wrap them like the red boxes, just simple uh, axis aligned binding boxes, which are very easy to test against a camera view, like a camera thrust them. But then bounding volume hierarchy notices that your vases childed to the table, so you can wrap a box between both of them. And then you can just test the blue box first, the main, the bigger one. And if it succeeds, if it's in the view, then you can test the other two, check if they're visible. If they're not visible like this, then you just check the blue box. And, and then uh, you already know that the red ones won't be visible. Just like the very basic, uh, most basic form of a spatial partitioning system, which is basically the same as your scene graph system. Then another concept is, for instance, the quatri which basically means that you wrap your entire world in a bounding box, and you test that against the camera. And obviously, this one intersects the camera view, and then you know that most, like some of these chickens will be uh, visible. And what happens when you do next, you, you basically subdivide that in four, like two by two, and then you test these subdivisions against the camera, and you iterate. So for instance, like, we consider the, the, the top right one as too far away from the camera, and the other, the bottom two ones, just outside of the camera view. And then you subdivide the one that's visible again in four, and you recurse until you're happy with the depth. And then you've already like, very quickly removed like, tons of chickens with a couple of bounding boxing tests. And otherwise, you would have to test one by one, which is a bit nutty. There's other systems. Uh, octrees are basically the same as quatrees, just in, in real 3D. So you divide everything in cubes rather than in quads. KD trees are a bit specific. They're, they divide everything in two kind of uh, 
arbitrarily. Like uh, binary space partitioning is a particular form of KD trees. That's what uh, Quake used to use back in the day. I'm not going into those, but I want to show you like one of the examples to see what a quatri and what a scene graph can do. Uh, you didn't see that error. So basically, you have like a whole landscape with tons of trees, like uh, grass leaves and everything. And it runs a bit slower here, I think, because of the projector. But trust me, back home, it ran at 60 frames per second. And this laptop is five years old, so it's kind of, I think, that, that for me, that's good enough. So and it's a pretty big world. Like, you can just keep going. And there's more there and around there. And there's trees everywhere. And I'm going to talk a bit about how this works. So this uses the idea of LOD, level of detail. And pretty much that means that it uses the idea that the concept that everything that's far away is small and needs less detail. Everything that's close is large on the screen. And uh, you need to render more detail. Like any Father Ted fans out here? Like, no one? Ah, there you go. That's great. So basically, just for the terrain, like so the landscape, uh, actually not counting the trees, just these mountains and stuff. Basically, what we do, we create like a, a recursive-looking, self-similar kind of structure. Like the camera is always in the middle of this, and you just move that whole uh, mesh, well, the sets of meshes along with the camera, and you snap it to a certain position. And so the middle part is a mesh that has the higher resolution, and then you start padding it around with uh, coarser and coarser meshes. And they're actually just the same meshes, just scaled differently and like, rotated around. And then you just use a, a height map to take these points of these, these quads, these meshes, and change the height of them in the, in the vertex shader. Then uh, to texture it in the fragment shader, because you, you want to have different types of surfaces. There's grass on the mountains. There's rocks on the mountains. There's snow on the top of them. So you just introduce a texture that contains this data. So by default, you just assume that everything is grass. And then you sample this texture. If it's red, for instance, uh, then you blend in sand. If it's green, then you blend in the texture for rock. If it's blue, snow. So that's what, what, what kind of creates this. Uh, let's see if it, like you can see the rock there. I don't, oh, that's very invisible. Can you see that at all? Like this. Maybe there. Yeah, there you can see the rock in the distance and the snow, and that's all uh, controlled by this by this texture. So now, if we would just have, for instance, um, one texture, uh, for instance, for the grass in this case, um, and cover the entire terrain with that, then, for instance, if you use a detailed texture, you will tile it a lot. But in the distance, it will look very tiled, because it repeats all the time. The human eye is very perceptive of, of patterns. So that will look very ugly. And likewise, if you just use a very coarse texture that looks good in the distance, close up, that's going to look very, very blurry and stuff. So you just basically introduce two sets, and you blend based on the, on the distance to the camera. I can let me go down to the beach, because there it's a bit obvious but with this. So you can see like the, the low detail kind of texture for the sand. It's very crisp and, and close to the camera, but in the distance, like all these, these kind of rocks. You can see the kind of the patterning still in the rocks, because I was kind of too lazy to, uh, to fix that. But like all the grass textures and stuff, you can't really notice the, the, the patterning that much, at least. Now, moving on from that, um, the trees. I, like, I recently built that. And of course, the, the trees are, contain that many objects. And even like with a quad tree, there's a lot of objects to draw. Like, uh, back to the view, like there's, there's so many objects. If we draw them all individually, it's very slow, because telling the GPU to draw an object, is, is, it has a lot of overhead. So luckily, GPUs and, and WebGL has this extension uh, that allows in, what, a technique called instance drawing. So basically, it allows you to have one draw call. You just tell the GPU, hey, draw 100 trees at once with different positions. And we use that to kind of uh, populate the world. But we don't use all the trees, because then you render all the trees all at the same time. And we don't want that. So we kind of divide the world into a grid. It looks kind of like this. We use hexagonal cells for distance calculations. That's why they're hexagonal. I'll get back to that later. But basically, each cell is one draw call. 
So you can see there, like there's, for instance, three trees in there, and those are drawn with one draw call. In the real project, there's actually like probably 50 trees in one draw call or something. And then, yeah, place trees into the cells. And then each cell is placed into the quad tree. So the system I, I explained earlier, like with the recursive subdivisions, so we can really f very quickly determine which are in the, uh, in the camera's view and which are not. And then you can get like these like, lots of trees. But of course, still playing with the concept of level of detail. So the closed trees really need a lot of detail. Let me get close to there, to one of the trees. So that tree needs a lot more detail than the ones all back there. So we basically introduced three meshes, one very high poly or like reasonably high poly, one low poly, and then one billboard. And the billboard is basically just the, the high poly rendered to a sprite that always faces the camera. So it's two triangles to, to draw, draw a tree. And in this case, you can really tell right, that the ones in the distance, right, let me just, you can see them flip, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a good modeler. So please forgive me for that. It, it illustrates the purpose of, of LOD. And you basically just use this, uh, these hexagonal cells, and you calculate the distance to them to the camera. And that's why they're hexagonal, because with cubes, there's always like a point that sticks out closer to the camera than your distance calculations, and those uh, constellations get, get messed up. And then, of course, there's also the grass blades. Uh, let's go to where they are, and like the flowers and stuff like that. And obviously, that's way too many objects, because there's going to be millions or billions of, of grass meshes in the whole scene. So that would use way too much memory if we, we just used the same technique as we did for the trees. So what we do is we create one batch, like one draw call, just around the camera, like that. Like the X's are comic sounds. I'm pretty proud of that. So basically, you just like create a, a circular area around the camera all the time and you fill it in with regularly spaced objects. And this batch, you just move it along with the camera. So if the camera moves, you do this. And it always snaps to that spacing. So it looks like the, 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 the grass isn't actually moving because that area is kind of um, too far to see, basically. Well, it, it, you fade that in. So it kind of looks like there's always grass around you in, in fixed positions. But that's going to look boring. That's going to, again, that's going to look like a pattern. So what you do is you introduce some, some noise-based offset and rotation. So every piece of grass is, is randomly rotated and, and placed. And then you can kind of get, get this look. Uh, if I we'll go up a bit more, then you can kind of see how they're placed if you look straight down from a distance. But you're not supposed to look straight down from a distance. You're supposed to look at it from here. So it looks kind of OK. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Like, OK, great. I was a bit worried that my shitty graphics would mess things up. I do apologize for the graphics. I'm just going to quickly go over the animation because like, uh, time is quickly running out. And I bet that everyone already knows this. So I'm not talking about just moving objects around the world. I'm actually talking about animating the mesh itself. And if you've ever uh, played Quake back in the day or, or messed around with Quake edited stuff, then you probably know that Quake uses morph targets. And basically, morph targets are just a timeline of baked animations. So every keyframe is a separate mesh. And it kind of looks like this. So running animation is just a bunch of meshes that are explicitly defined in the file and that the, the renderer uh, picks depending on where it is in the timeline. Usually, you'd interpolate between vertices. I think Quake 2 did that already, but Quake 1 didn't even do that. But it's a bit of an outdated technique, because you need a lot of data if you want a lot of uh, animations, which is really not useful. And it's very rigid. So what it's still used for now and then, especially in WebGL, because you can't really have that many uh, kind of uh, detailed animations otherwise, you introduce relative morph targets. So you just have, for instance, for facial animations, you have your basic mesh uh, for the face. And then for every kind of pose, like a smile or a frown, you tell for every vertex how it should move, like in what direction it should move. And then you can blend between them. It's like, a, I don't know if you've ever seen this demo. I think it's already like 14 years old or something. And that's how it works. Like, they really, like NVIDIA put this demo together, and they really got these uh, complex facial animations for its day, uh, of course. 
Uh, and that's just by, by using different poses and blending them together uh, at runtime. But this is very limited because you can only kind of blend an image. You can't really do anything more with that. So a more complex system is called uh, skeletal animations, and you all know that, I think. Basically, you just introduce a skeleton that contains a node for the head, shoulders, hands, fingers, if you want to get really detailed, and you move those. And then for every vertex in your mesh, you assign them to one or more of these uh, bones or joints, uh, whatever you want to call them. And when you move the bones, then the vertices will take over their transform and, and move along with that. And the vertex positions can be calculated in the shader, which makes it quite fast to do. And I will give you quickly an example, just because, I'll be honest, I just want to show you a chicken. So you can blend between different keyframe animations quite efficiently without really noticing when the animation starts, because you can just make it keep jumping, and it really doesn't glitch. Like that, that's the nice part again. I just like this chicken. <laughs> I have to turn this off because this is using resources. So uh, what's more, that it, it's not only very flexible and because you can blend between many animations because you only deal with a limited amount of, of, of nodes and bones that, that, uh, instead of all the vertices. What's more, you can apply physics to them. So for instance, if you have a walking or running animation that's running upstairs, normally this, the, the animated version would put feet at the same uh, height, basically. And then you can use inverse kinematics to move the foot up the stairs and stuff and make it apply to the world. Or ragdoll animations when you kill an enemy. It, it will like, take over. Physics will take over. And of course, you can script the nodes. So for instance, the head, animation, uh, the head node can always look at the player, or like, you can use it for aiming a gun and stuff like that, which makes it very powerful. And I just wanted to do, like, mention that because it's probably like, one of the things you're going to want to build in a 3D engine. Now, uh, putting things together. Like you have, for instance, uh, apart from the scene graph, uh, you have the user input that you need to respond to. You've got uh, AI that you need to uh, execute. There's physics that you probably want to apply. So how do you combine all those things? And a very traditional way of through inheritance, so if you do object-oriented coding, uh, you basically, like 3GS works in that way, that you have an object 3D, mesh extends that, light extends that, audio extends that, and then you have an object that, that does the skeleton animations uh, called skin mesh that extends mesh. And then you have, for instance, for user input control, you can have an external orbit controls object that just targets the camera, for instance. And then in like old engines, uh, you would run into like that enemy, for instance, extends mesh or skin mesh as well. And then you get like very weird behavior, like in Doom, where enemies start killing each other because they made some inheritance error and then called it a feature. I think the actual liner notes of Doom says they hate each other as much as they hate you. Which is and mo a more modern way uh, is through composition, which if you do OO, you always prefer composition over inheritance because it's more flexible and more decoupled. And the entity component system is, is like a very popular way of handling that. Uh, Unity uses it, uh, and they recently released a new version, which is more data-oriented, which I'll get back to, but I haven't really looked into how that works exactly. A-Frame uses a system like that, and Helix uses a system like that as well. And what it is, basically, your game object or your scene graph object, like it's called a game object in Unity, it's called an entity in uh, A-Frame and in Helix. That's all there is to it. That's your scene graph object. There's nothing more to it. There's nothing really that extends entity. But what you do is you define behavior through components, which are tiny classes that contain certain logic. Like, for instance, your mesh uh, and material combination. In Helix, it's called a mesh instance, and the mesh is just the geometry data, and then a material is how it renders. You can assign that to an entity, but you can also assign an audio emitter to that entity. So this entity can do both things. And you, for instance, can add a light to it or an orbit controller, and that's all contained in that one object. And that means that, that components are very modular. They do one thing, they do it well, and you can share it. So, and you can combine uh, different components to, to get like, specific behaviors. And it's, it's very shareable, it's reusable. So if you build something, they can just send it to someone else or apply it to another entity, and it should work as long as you, you, you wrote it correctly. Then there's another thing uh, called systems, which A-Frame uh, kind of develops in, in, in a way like this. I don't know how many people used A-Frame, but in, in that case, you probably know this. 
Because uh, as I said, components do one thing, do it uh, well, and they're isolated. So it, it's very hard for a component to talk to other components without doing complex search uh, strategies and stuff. So for instance, um, if you have an audio emitter that contains an audio file of some sort, if you would just use components, then you would have to basically load the audio file for every component, which is, has that much overhead that you don't want. So you could introduce an audio system in, in A-Frame that contains an audio cache, which then all the audio emitter objects could just say, like, hey, give me that system. But they're tightly coupled. So every component has a, a, an associated system, and it maps directly to each other, which I think is, is a bit limiting. So in Helix, I implemented it uh, a bit like this. So there is just, for instance, an AI system that's completely separate from everything else. It can talk to the game engine, the entity engine, but it, it, it doesn't really talk to the like, components don't talk to it directly. And for instance, uh, to give you an idea, like if you have an enemy kind of component, which is just a tag, basically, it, it's an empty component that's just there as a data uh, model. Mesh instance is to make it render, and alive means that it's running around and uh, doing stuff. But by itself, it wouldn't do anything because those components, enemy and alive, are empty. So you can have an AI system and that requests what's called, what I call a set. And a set is just a collection of all the entities containing a certain combination of components. So you can say, like, OK, give me all the entities. Give me the set of entities containing uh, the enemy component that are alive and give me a set that contains a player component and are alive. And then you can perform AI on that. And you can make the enemies attack. For instance, if you're uh, developing Pac-Man, the AI system would, would do all the calculations that make the ghost chase Pac-Man. But what's more, uh, systems can be stopped and started. So in the case of Pac-Man, you're a normal, uh, let's call it search player uh, AI system is running. If the player eats like a little ecstasy thing in the game, then you can stop the search system and start the flea system. And that changes the, the complete behavior of the enemies immediately, and they start running away. So it's very flexible, it's very dynamic, it's decoupled. And that allows you to, to really um, make, make components as, as, as data containers and, and have, a, instead of more object-oriented uh, design pattern, have a more data-driven design pattern. And that's also what, what Unity kind of is aiming for with their latest update, uh, with the new ECS that they released. And so you can use components just as tags, uh, like the alive thing. So you don't need like in Unity separate tags assigned to objects, which I think is kind of unnecessary if you have components. And you can use them as state machines, as I said, like the, the flea and, and search stuff uh, with Pac-Man, for instance. So um, oh, I think I'm pretty good on time still. Is everyone still like with me here? OK, yes, great. <laughs> uh, so I want, just uh, want to talk a bit about rendering in general, but also through a case study, because I'm a bit light on examples up till now. Uh, so what rendering needs to do, basically in very broad strokes, it needs to determine what's visible from the camera, it needs to render these objects, apply lighting to it, and then probably you want to do some, some tone mapping or bloom post-processing and, and stuff like that on it. Very good resource, which is uh, since recently released for free online, just open. It's the Bible for physically based rendering. So everything you need to know is in there uh, when it comes to lighting and post like uh, depth of field kind of stuff as well. Uh, it's a bit theoretical, and it mainly deals with ray tracing. But all the concepts are directly applicable to, to rasterized based rendering as well, like uh, you would do in, in WebGL. I really recommend you uh, checking that out. It's very useful. Changed my life. No, no kidding. So I want to show you this, this skin rendering example that I did as an example of rendering. So basically, let me. Uh, so I, I was trying to get as, as, as close as possible as I could uh, using WebGL to get like high detailed kind of skin rendering. I'm not a great modeler, and I had to make some. Uh, well, I'm not a modeler at all, uh, and I had to make some changes to the mesh in the eye, and, and I had to model the eye. So that could have been done better, but I just wanted to do something within a stretch of three, four days and get something uh, uh, that, that looked so acceptable. Let me uh, stop the lights because that's uh, going to be annoying. So basically, starting with the skin. So a very important part of, of rendering lights is rend uh, rendering skin is rendering the lighting for it. 
And if you've ever done lighting, then you'll know that lighting generally consists out of two components. There's diffuse, which gives like a, this, this carpet here its purple color. And that's when light enters an object, gets scattered around a bit, and exits the object. And then it absorbs certain uh, wavelengths of light, and that gives it the color. Or there are specular reflections, which give objects their highlights. And that just means that light doesn't enter the object and just immediately reflects. So for the diffuse rendering, because skin is slightly translucent, as I said, light enters an object. But with skin, because it's translucent, it can travel quite far away inside your skin before it exits again. That makes it kind of flashy and, and, and a bit blurrier than, 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 for instance, concrete or plastic. And basically what, what happens, uh, how you do this, is you render all the diffuse light separately to just do a, a view-based texture. And then you blur it three times. Um, some guy like Eugène Dion, he came up with a technique of approximating the scattering function, how light scatters in your, uh, in your skin, with six Gaussian blur functions. And then uh, Jorge Jimenez, I hope I pronounced that name right, uh, reduced that to three blurs. And then you color blend them together. And every blur kind of represents a layer of skin that, that transports light differently. Like an image says so much more. So basically, you just render all the, the color information and, and the lighting to, to a texture. You blur them, but not like a normal Gaussian blur, like a Photoshop uses the screen space distance uh, to, to know how much weight to assign. With this, you use the actual world space distance, because that's, that's where the light is traveling. And then you just blend them together with different colors. Like, again, this was like, uh, defined by people much, much smarter th than me. So th this, I didn't come up with that at all. But that's, this is how like, video games tend to uh, render skin nowadays. Then a uh, second aspect of the skin rendering is the highlights. And if you've ever done 3D rendering, you're going to know functions like Fong or stuff. If you uh, use 3D Studio, just uh, like the, define the shape and, and the size of your highlight. Uh, with uh, physically based rendering, like in real time, they usually use the, uh, co what's called uh, GGX or Trowbridge Writes uh, specular function. And basically, that function, just if you're interested, it's just kind of a probability function of the microscopic details in each pixel. And it gives you the probability of how many normals on that microscopic surface are pointed in the right direction so that the light enters your eyes. That's basically, but it doesn't matter. That's all in the, the, the physically based rendering book. And of course, GGX is, is very good for plastic, for concrete, for most objects. But for skin, it, I, I always thought it was a bit too plasticky and too, too, too fake. So I, I, I used the, another function called Backman, which is also usually in, in, in like a professional 3D software somewhere, but you don't often find it in 3D engines. But so what I do is I simulate two reflective layers because of the complexity of skin. So you have a, just a very rough base layer, and you have a kind of oily top layer, because most skin has a layer of oil that reflects uh, light directly, and then there's a layer beneath that's rougher that uh, reflects it together. And basically, I blend those two functions together to get the, the final result. And then I don't know if, yeah, that's going to be lost on here. I think you can't, you're not going to really be able to see the highlights. Or can you? Yeah, there you go. You can see it. So that's kind of, so you can see here, like the, the, the light kind of reflects a bit more nicely than, than it would be with, uh, than it would with GGX. This part is all for like more shader geeks and stuff, by the way. So if you use normal skin textures or a normal out of the box PBR material, then you basically just can assign a, a color map, a normal map, and a roughness map. And the roughness map, uh, by the way, just defines kind of the, the, the size of the highlight and the strength of the highlight uh, in very rough terms. But especially in WebGL, you're usually limited. If you want to run it on mobile, you're often still limited to 2K textures. But even with 4K textures, like a texture covering the whole head is not capable of capturing the really fine detail that, that, that skin contains, like all the pores and all the kind of imperfections. So we introduce, like similar to what we did with the, with the terrain, we introduce a separate uh, high detail kind of texture. We just tile it all over the, the place. And that just like there's a, a normal map that kind of looks like, a, like an orange, orange kind of surface uh, to get some detail. Uh, let me, I hope that's visible from here. All right, let me turn off the depth of field. 
By the way, neat trick, depth of field always makes skin look better, but that's cheating. But, you know, you use the tools you got. So you can see like the, the high detail, like kind of bumpy detail in there. That's all the, the, the detail texture. And that would be completely lost if, if it or I wasn't using that. And there's like here as well, like all this kind of the wrinkles and stuff. Uh, that's all like the high detail texture. It's still not perfect, but it's, it's better than using the standard texture. And finally, ooh, running out of time, I think. Well, so should have five minutes. So uh, finally, the eyes, which was really why I did the project, because the, the, the old one was kind of just the skin. I did that before, and I really wanted to, to, to render eyes. Basically, one of the most important aspects of how eyes look is the fact that there's a cornea in front of it, which kind of is this, you can see this bulbous kind of uh, shape that reflects light, because it's a, it's a, it's a very dense uh, kind of material. So, so when light travels through different types of material, it bends. Like if it goes through water, it bends. You, know, you all know this uh, effect. And that's a very important part of how I, eyes look. And maybe a bit more surprisingly, it also uh, causes caustics, which kind of gives this lifelike highlight in your eyes, which is very important when you're rendering eyes. Otherwise, you get these really dead-looking eyes. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that these eyes look very alive, but I think like when you're rendering something that's going to look creepy anyway, go all the way and like, really make the eyes like, turn far, because that's what makes it fun. But you can see like, if, if you move like this, you can sort of see the, the, the caustics uh, like, brightening up the eyes and stuff, like, like this. I don't know if you can see that. There. It's very subtle, but it really brings a spark to, to the iris. And I'll just quickly uh, explain with, with my shitty graphical skills uh, how this is done. So basically, the eye is modeled like a, a, a bulb, uh, like that. And what you do, there's a basic GLSL function that's good enough for, for this kind of type of stuff called refract, and that well, refracts light. So you have the view ray, which is the, the, kind of the, the ray that goes from the camera to the point you're, you're drawing, to that, the, the point on the cornea, that refracts it, that bends it. And then in your shader, in your fragment shader, you mathematically define a cone, which there's mathematical formulas online that you can use for that. And they also have the, the formulas that, that allow you to calculate the intersection point with the refracted ray. So basically, you just calculate that point, and you can use that to access, uh, like to, to generate a UV coordinate, which is a texture coordinate that just contains the iris. And then you can get like this. Uh, right, let's stop looking at the camera, just look in front. So it looks like the, the, the iris kind of fills up the, 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 the bulb of, of the, the cornea, which it would otherwise not do because it's actually just behind it. And then just a quick word about caustics if you're really into shaders. Uh, what caustics are are basically just light diverging or narrowing, like think of it as a kid, of course we never did, but using a magnifying glass to burn wasps, because wasps are evil. So basically that's, that's caustics, that's just light energy focusing and the point where it, it focuses on becomes brighter. And we can do that just by calculating both areas. So we take the, the, the light direction between two adjacent pixels and again, the, uh, the intersection with, uh, with the cone of the, the iris. And we compare the area between the two, and it's just the caustics are just multiplied to it, and that's the, the, the ratio of the two areas, basically, and that gives like a brighter or a dimmer effect. And there's like a, just you can use the, the for the shader geeks, uh, the differential equations in GLSL for that, uh, because those give you the, the difference between height and width, which multiplied together gives you an area. You just divide the two. You can't do that in the same pass as you render the actual iris, you have to do that viewed from the light just for technical details. So if you start implementing stuff like this, you'll notice why. And I think that's it. Uh, I hope that made sense. <laughs> the, I, I can be a bit hacky. Thank you.